Welcome uh, and, and thank you again, uh, Marcus, for having accepted to, to speak in, in this uh, joint uh, seminar. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce you uh, to the audience very briefly. Um, uh, I, I think uh, what is important uh, that, uh, to, to highlight a very international career with a PhD um, uh, conducted at Columbia University, then uh, two years at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology in the Mellon Fellow Program, Science, Technology and Society. Uh, you were a professor um, at Peru um, uh, for, for numbers of, of years, but then uh, joining you know, first as a visiting professor, uh, the Casa uh, Oswaldo Cruz um, in Rio de Janeiro, where you uh, are still uh, now um, a professor and of the history of uh, medicine and editor of the journal Historia Ciencias a Sauda. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, very interesting publication have come out from your different works um, during the time. And then I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple of them, uh, which were uh, important, uh, I think, for our audience. There is a whole range of different publications around questions concerning public health and uh, the history of medicine in uh, different Latin American countries. Um, one of the latest books uh, you published is Cold War and Deadly Fevers, Malaria Eradication in Mexico, uh, which has come uh, out uh, uh, 2007. Uh, uh, and uh, there is also a volume uh, that you co-published with Stephen Palmer, uh, Medicine and Public Health in uh, Latin uh, uh, America. Um, other publications, uh, were around the questions of epidemics, health and society in Peru during the 20th century, um, uh, but also uh, a broader, uh, uh, well, co-authored book um, uh, that you you published um, with uh, about the history of uh, Peru. Um, the other second broader part, perhaps, of your oeuvre uh, is around uh, the internationalization of cooperation uh, in public health in the 20th century uh, with a, a very valuable work uh, on the value of health, a history of the Pan-American Health Organization, which was published, uh, I think, first in, in, in Spanish uh, and then later translated um, to uh, English, but also uh, you co-authored the World Health Organization, a history uh, uh, which uh, uh, Patricia and I use uh, um, as your other works uh, also in our uh, joint uh, seminar that we teach here between um, um, Berlin and, and Oxford. So we're really pleased that you have accepted to, to speak um, in um, our uh, uh, joint seminar uh, about the backlash against global health, Brazil and, and AIDS 2007 to 2019. Uh, a very interesting and, and broad uh, subject that will bring us to both uh, local uh, evolutions in uh, Brazil, but also more a broader global picture. I'm very much looking forward to listen to you just perhaps one last point to the audience we will record uh, uh, the first part um, of uh, this presentation or of this seminar the presentation of Marcus so if you don't want to uh, be part uh, of it uh, just leave your camera uh, off and and you won't be seen uh, here. Uh, so once more, uh, thank you everybody to be here and I'm very happy uh, to listen what uh, Marcus will 
present to us. Okay, well, thank you very much for that uh, kind presentation. I'm delighted to be with the two seminars at Oxford, and um, I have a PowerPoint. Um, thanks again for, for the invitation. Delighted to be here, and if anybody has any comments or criticism, I will be very will be delighted to hear them. So I've been working in the past few years in a history of AIDS in Brazil. And um, well, there's an image of a Christ that is a symbol of uh, Rio de Janeiro where every year, uh, the 1st of December is the AIDS day and all the NGOs uh, have a ceremony in, in the crime. So there are three organizing principles of this book. First, the idea that AIDS was an exceptional disease. That was like a code term very much used since the beginning of the epidemic in the early 1980s. Um, it was exceptional because it appeared when developed countries had for many experts control infectious diseases. And this was a new infection that was affecting rich and poor countries alike. So the transition to a, um, a epidemiological panorama or in developed countries where only chronic diseases would be hegemonic. Uh, the, this assumption was uh, um, no longer valid. It was also considered exceptional because um, it uh, elicited many medical research and new public health practice, like for example, the protection of the sick in contrast to the isolation of the sick that was usually done in previous epidemics. It was also exceptional because it attracted a lot of money. Some of the major agencies in um, international health at the time um, were devoted to AIDS or had a very important uh, goal of controlling AIDS. Uh, it was a controversial term, but there was a narrative that AIDS was exceptional and it was also exceptional for the activists that thought that in the responses to AIDS, they could touch issues usually uh, not part of public health, like discrimination by gender orientation or the prices of medications. So I'm, the first idea is to see how exceptional was really AIDS in Brazil and at the time and how this exceptionalism has in any case experienced a decline in the past 15 years. Um, the second organizing principle has to do especially with activists. I have the idea or what I have found is that there's a lot of circulation of people, treatment, ideas, policies during this whole period that Brazilian activists uh, have contact not only with activists of other countries, but with multilateral agencies, with bilateral agencies, with philanthropic, and in all of them, they are shaping new ideas, not only for AIDS, but for public health. For example, that public health should uh, be combined with human rights in the protection, for example, of the sick, or that medications are public goods and not only commodities that should be protected by patents. So there is a circulation of knowledge of people, of meanings uh, that I think is interesting in which the Brazilians participated. And the third issue that I want to explore in the book is uh, what is global health? Uh, there have been a number of studies, including an article I wrote um, some years ago on the transition from international health that was a term very much used during the Cold War, meaning from the late 40s until 
the beginning of the 1980s. And then suddenly this new concept of global health appears, uh, meaning that not only the state will intervene in, in health issues, but public private partnerships that NGOs have an important role to play. And there is even an important historian of medicine in the US, um, Alan Brand, that believed that the whole concept of global health that was a proposal to how to carry out international health and a number of public health journals change their name and include the term global health. And there are even schools of public health that begin to be called schools of global health. Um, the, there, there is, a, an, a, I was saying, an historian of medicine, Alan Brand, that says that uh, global health was created with the responses to AIDS. So in some ways, I'm trying to explore that issue too and see how or if it's a decline of global health during the past few years, uh, even before the pandemic that we are suffering today. Um, to mention briefly uh, that this book has um, three chapters. So in the three chapters go around the idea that there is a cycle of boom and bust. Uh, first uh, is a history of the first health activists in Brazil in the 1980s and how they um, are able to, cons to achieve a uh, to obtain funding, especially from American philanthropic foundations that have not worked before in health, like the Ford Foundation, but have a record in human rights, and make this interesting combination between new science and human rights, something that is usually attributed to an American that worked at the World Health Organization. His name was Jonathan Mann, that he was the first that conceptualized health and human rights. But I would argue that at the same time in the 80s, there were people in other parts of the world that were working and writing in, in, that, direct, in that direction. The second chapter or the second section of the book is um, anti-retrovirus. And I have to uh, describe briefly something about the history of the epidemic. For the first 15 years of the epidemic of AIDS, there was no effective treatment. And namely from 1981 to 1996, there were a few drugs, but the emphasis was on prevention. But in the mid nineties, a series of drugs appear called antiretrovirals that could stop the replication of the virus in the human body. Uh, it was announced in a major meeting in June of 1996 uh, that a combination of three of these drugs could be effective and that transformed AIDS from a dead sentence to a chronic disease. The problem was that initially they were very expensive because they were only produced by private pharmaceutical companies. And most of the multilateral and international agencies said, well, this is only for developed countries. Developing countries should stick with prevention because it's not cost effective that they invest money in obtaining this new medication. But the Brazil, Brazil was the first country that went against this a mainstream belief that these drugs were not for poor nations. And this meeting was in June and by December, uh, after a few months of work of uh, NGOs and activists and health workers, the government decided to distribute these drugs through the public health system. So it was the first country that decided that it will be accessible to all people in need. I will explain more about this second chapter in a moment. In the last chapter uh, is uh, the regression of these progressive policies in Brazil that have occurred in the last about 15 years. I sent a paper to Patricia, it's a draft, that deals with the third chapter, with the last section. Um, 
But I think that it would be, if somebody wants to send me comments, I would be delighted to hear them and, and they will be very useful. But I, in this presentation, I will say a word about the second chapter and the last chapter. Uh, just a note about the sources, I've been using the archives of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller Archive Center in Oxide, New York City. I had the papers of the Ford Foundation that had a very close relationship with Brazil and with Brazilian NGOs working on AIDS, the archives of the World Health Organization in Geneva. Also very important for me have been the Peter Piot papers that are the London School of Tropical Medicine. Peter Piot uh, was the director of UNAIDS, the main multilateral agency working on AIDS. He was director from 1996 to 2008. And he visited several times Brazil and considered Brazil for a, for a time like a model for the rest of the developing countries. And also archives in um, Brazil, especially there's a major NGO that was active all these years where it has a very good archive. And I have been collecting some oral histories and obviously I was not able to collect more during the last year. So the second, um, chapter or section, access to antiretrovirals. Um, the main idea of this section is that this is a moment when there's a consolidation of uh, democratic governments. Uh, Brazil was coming out from a military dictatorship in 1985, and only in the 90s it con could consolidate its democracy. Um, uh, by a center-right government with a president called Fernando Enrique Cardoso uh, in the 1990s and beginning in the 21st century, a center-left government uh, with a president Lula, with President Lula that was president for two terms. Well, this is a moment of consolidation of democratic governments, also of economic growth. Brazil began to export agricultural commodities and becomes a leader in some of these commodities, but also of a social medical alliance. And that, that's one of the main issues I want to study. Uh, the activists that have been very vocal in the 80s and many times criticizing the government are able to make a partnership with health officers, with uh, scientists, uh, with uh, public health organizations, and eventually they recruit diplomats and work to make Brazil a leader in global health. They create also partnerships with international NGOs, participate in a number of important meetings um, uh, that take place around the world, or not only the World Health Organization, but they participate our speakers, important speakers in meetings of the, of the United Nations. They organize a meeting at the World Trade Organization and are able to pass resolutions and declarations in favor of access to drugs for developing countries. And I just want to mention four uh, aspects of this moment. Um, First, it was part of a national health system that had been created after the military. Brazil is one of the few countries that has a national health system. SUS is the acronym in Portuguese for Sistema Único de Saúde. And they create a program uh, for AIDS that is very active. And, and, and uh, for the first time, the idea that if you're a citizen, you are entitled to receive medicines and public health program for the government appears. No? That is something new, probably it existed in uh, Europe with a welfare state after a war, but here in Latin America, only a few countries uh, have be begun to, to implement that idea in the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, secondly, it was important because they defied uh, pharmaceutical companies. This companies um, in the 80s and 90s rely on the, a new organization called the World Trader uh, Organization to enforce 
what they call the laws of intellectual property in developing countries. Namely, they wanted all developing countries to respect the patents for their drugs, namely uh, to grant them a monopoly of about usually 20 years that they will be the only ones to um, distribute and produce these drugs in their, in the, in the, in their countries. In Brazil was important because it was a big market for many of these companies. And in opposition to this idea, they defy the pharmaceutical companies and say that they were ready to break the patents, something that was contemplated in international law that in the case of an emergency, you can break a patent. And they created a whole discourse and had a number of trials with pharmaceutical companies saying that life-saving drugs are more important that, than intellectual property laws. And there is a confrontation, an interesting confrontation, and also some tension in this alliance that I mentioned before, because the activists wanted the government to break all patents, begin to produce only what is called a generic drugs, as it was done in India, but the government, even the government of the Workers' Party, the government of Lula, always try to um, obtain a reduced price from pharmaceuticals. And many times the pharmaceuticals were willing to reduce the prices after some negotiation, and the government presented this as an achievement, but the activists knew or believed that a reduced price was always higher than a generic, and it might be undermining the promotion of a national drug industry. That was another objective of the government. A word about impact, there's a decline in the morbidity and mortality of AIDS in the country, and Brazil achieves international leadership. The World Bank decides to give a number of very important, sizable loans to Brazil is one of the developing countries that receive most money from the World Bank to fight AIDS. And they are very interested in how they negotiate with a bank because the bank initially want them only to work on prevention. And they say, well, with your money, we'll work on, with, you know, on prevention, but we will use our own funds to work on treatment. Um, and also they receive an award from the Gates Foundation that includes uh, an important donation and the World Health Organization creates a program based on the Brazilian experience. Um, this is a, an image of um, part of this international alliances that they are creating. I mean, a rally in South Africa where people are calling for generic drugs uh, activists and they become celebrities. No, Lula is received by the Queen uh, of England after a meeting of the G20 countries. No, he is celebrated as an international figure, not, not only because of what he's doing on AIDS, but also, also because of his social policies and um, using, using what some people call soft power. That is a concept developed by Robert Nye in the US that. Uh, developing countries use their own social programs to promote their own international uh, geopolitical position in the world. Um, and, um, let, 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 just let me say that you, you have a continuity in these policies from the mid 1990s until the end of Lula term. In the mid 1990s to the beginning of the 21st century, you have a center-right government that maintains this anti-AIDS policy, part of a big program of prevention, and they are fighting homophobia. And Lula, that is a center-left government uh, that is elected in 2003 and will continue for a second term until 2008, maintains these policies. Um, the US that didn't like very much this confrontation with um, pharmaceutical companies uh, has a number of trials with Brazil, no? 
uh, and confrontations in the World Trade Organization. But what they do is very intelligent in some ways because they create an alternative without mentioning Brazil at all. Uh, they create another bilateral program that received a lot of money in 2003 that is called PECFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, they don't give the money to UNAIDS. They don't give the money to the World Trade Organization. They don't tout Brazil at all. It's not mentioned in the discourses of President Bush at the time that was the promoter of this program. No? Um, and, but it's, it's different from the Brazilian model. Uh, for example, they promote drugs produced by pharmaceutical companies. The director of PEPFAR says that he does not trust generic drugs, that they are not safe, that they are not reliable, and that they will only use drugs produced by American or European companies. So as in many uh, disease control campaigns, a uh, major governmental program is a subsidy for the industry too. You know? and they can treat less people than what they could treat if they use generic drugs, even if these generic drugs were approved by the World Trade Organization. Uh, secondly, one major difference is that they promote what is called the ABC. It's a recipe for prevention. A stands for abstinence before marriage, B for be faithful, and the C uh, for the use of condoms. You know? And it was a recipe uh, promoted by evangelicals. The, they were different from the conservative of the 1980s. They were not always condemning, condemning uh, AIDS as a divine punishment. They believed that AIDS people should receive some kind of treatment, but that they should promote a new idea of what was family and of religious values. And the C is in italics, because um, according to PEPFAR, it was all right if you all embrace A and B, abstinence and be faithful, because evangelicals believe that if you promoted condoms, it was an invitation to sexual promiscuity. So you could drop the C and just stick with A and B. And uh, that was very much against Brazil at the time that, for example, among its alliances, it has an important alliance with the NGOs of sex workers um, and, and, and when they were going to make a donation to Brazil, uh, when USAID was going to make a small donation to the Brazilian program, they asked the Brazilian government to sign a pledge that they were going to eliminate prostitution. And the uh, Brazilian government, Lula, uh, rejected the donation, saying that they had a history of work uh, with uh, these NGOs of sex workers, and they would not sign the pledge. So in that race, in the future, a whole discussion of um, sexual work in, in the country. No? Um, something interesting also is that in the same year, the US was invading Iraq. No? And it has become clear that the money spent in that military operation was like 20 times the money spent by, the money uh, earmarked for Um So, um, I have two more slides that deal with um, the design of the program. And um, so what happens uh, after 2007, the, there is a legacy of the financial economic crisis of 2008 that is really felt in Brazil in 2013 with a crisis of the export of commodities accusation of corruptions and a number of social protests. At a time, we we'll still have a president of the Workers' Party, that is the lady on the left, Dilma Rousseff, that she couldn't complete her second term because there was an impeachment, a controversial impeachment, and her vice president, Temer, that also appears in this image, uh, become president for about a year and a half, and he's closer to a neoliberal discourse that says that all the things that have been wrong in Brazil for the past uh, about 20 years are because of the Workers' Party. And also evangelicals have growth 
uh, have an incredible goals in the country. They are about the fourth of the country, an important presence in Congress, and control many institutions. No? And there is a crisis in, the, in this alliance between the government and the NGOs and activists. The, the activists began to demand a more radical move from the government, and Dilma believed that it, it has to appease the conservatives and the evangelicals, names a very neoliberal minister of finance, and retires a number of um, prevention programs that offend evangelicals. No? I, I think that uh, on an international level, there is also a crisis because when there are less funds for AIDS after the financial crisis of 2008, a number of agencies in the government of President Obama launched a campaign called the end of AIDS. Um, maybe some of you have remember Hillary Clinton some years ago saying that the um, uh, AIDS free generation was uh, about to happen, that it was possible. But it, behind that discourse, they were emphasizing a biomedical intervention. The new magic bullet was not only antiretrovirus, but a new pill uh, that was discovered around that time that was pre exposure prophylaxis that was going to be used only in risk groups. Uh, people, men who have sex with men, transsexuals, and the idea was that it was no longer necessary to work with all developing countries or to have broad prevention campaigns or to have a special alliance with the NGOs. That is something that could be conducted from the official health services. And this is an image of the protest uh, in Brazil in 2013, 2014 because Brazil decided at the time of Lula that it was going to organize a World Cup in the Olympics. And then they, they have this poster saying that we need good health or good public services, hospitals and education and not these stadiums. There was also a big accusation of corruption in, in this government. No? Uh, evangelicals, this is an evangelical member of Congress that is also the president of the Commission of Human Rights. It has a statement that reminds the statements of the 1980s when the disease appeared. No? AIDS is a gay disease and it came from that people. No? So homophobia reappears with force in, in, in this time. And there is a resistance, there's a cover of a magazine of an NGO that is accusing uh, the return of an ideological virus that is one of the main obstacles against the disease. And then I have tried to deal with the um, last years of Bolsonaro. Uh, his was, he began to be president in January of 2019. And what he be, Bolsonaro began in 2018 and was president until 2022, and um, he embraces A and B, no? this recipe, abstinence and be faithful, not the C at all. Uh, and he is an evangelical. He's seen as the leader of the evangelicals. He was raised as a Catholic, but became an evangelical about five years ago when he decided to run for president. He favored private pharmaceuticals before the Ministry of Health had to buy uh, medications produced in Brazil by public and private companies, which helped the development of a drug industry. But now they can buy medicine from anywhere in the world. Uh, the, he cut resources from the national health system, attacks NGOs in general, and he ended the AIDS programs in the ministry. There's no longer an AIDS program in the ministry. No? Some officers have been uh, relocated to different units. And one of the main problems is that there is a disorganized resistance of the left. And these are my final reflections. So the whole book is like a history of boom and bust. 
no? A Brazil Connect Sustainable Model, something that I can probably address later if there's a question. Uh, I just try, will try to give some reasons why that happened in the, this last part. I think that this, in this process of transnational circulation, what occurred was really a co-optation of some elements of the Brazilian program, namely treatment. But they, many agencies dismiss the broad prevention anti-homophobic programs that Brazil had been promoting. And for example, you had the World Health Organization uh, with a program of uh, access to drugs in countries where homosexuality was a crime. And they thought they could combine these two issues and I think they could not. I also believe that the whole discourse of ending AIDS undermine the priority that disease have because it, it represented that it's something that would not be a problem in the future or that was almost all. The fragmentation of the left in the in Brazil and the emergence of all these conservative forces. Still, AIDS is a major problem and it has been growing. Uh, and all of that happened before COVID-19. And in my opinion, or for the moment, the idea that I'm having is that at least in Brazil, there has been an end of this exceptionalism that the disease had in the late 80s and in the 90s. And all of this happened before COVID. Thank you. I'm sorry if I talk too much.